Hey everybody, Rachel Ray here. In every class for our very first cooking camp together, we're gonna cook together, not just us, but a lot of my friends. You guys are gonna learn so many great techniques. You're gonna have so much fun. And at the end, you get to eat and share with all the people you love. And you know what I love? Everything we're doing together is gonna benefit the Boys and Girls Club of America and a brand new scholarship project. So we're doing well for others while we're making great food and doing well for ourselves and the people that we love. Thank you to all of our sponsors for making this possible. Game on, let's turn up the heat. All right, is it time to bring in our guest camp counselor today? The chef who holds a world record for creating the largest the world's largest stir fry at 4,010 pounds. Red Rover, Red Rover, send Jet Tila over. Hey, Chef, how are you? What's happening, everybody? Uh, Jet Tila here. Um, what up, Cappy? Thanks for uh, bringing us in. Rachel Ray, thank you very much. And all of you guys, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate you. Uh, it's time to take stir fry or take out um, to into the kitchen. And then we're going to be doing some fun stuff today. Uh, I'm going to be making with you perfect rice, which is a fundamental skill every camper needs to know for uh, their cooking life. And we're going to be doing beef and broccoli. It's probably one of the most famous um, Asian dishes ever, or especially specifically uh, Chinese American. But within this class, you're going to learn uh, micro classes on how to make your stir fry better, how to season, how Asian chefs kind of use different pantry ingredients. So there it is. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. I think there's, is there business to be done, Cappy, before, uh, before we get cooking? Um, why don't we stop down for 30 seconds or so if anyone needs to run to the fridge or the pantry, do so now, and then we'll get and I'll, started. I'll talk you through the first pantry. So I'm going to break this up into a few pieces, guys. Uh, for those of you that are cooking along, good on you. Uh, we're going to start by making rice first because rice takes about 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, hopefully by the time your rice is done, your beef and broccoli is going to be done, you can pair it all together. So again, uh, Cappy is the main counselor here. So he's going to have to tell me kind of uh, when to start and what to do uh, what. So do you want me to go through some ingredients or are we going to, um, you know, tell me, give me some counseling, Cappy. That's what yes, I need right yes, now. Yes, yes, sir. From one, count, from one counselor to another. Um, why don't we get going with the rice? So everyone, if they haven't come prepared with the rice, you're good. Um, chef will show you how to do that. And then okay. we'll have a little pop in from there and then we'll switch over to stir fry. How's that sound? Let's do it. Okay, sounds good. So um, rice is one of these fundamental um, ingredients, not just in the Asian culture, uh, but just for so many different cultures. The problem is even really established chefs don't know how to make rice well. I'm going to knock out 75% of the rice world for you in this demonstration. Sounds good? So, um, all right. I'm going to use jasmine rice, uh, friends. So, uh, but remember, this technique applies to any white rice, all right? Um, any white rice. So, I'm going to do it in a bowl so it's clear and you can see what's happening. But basically, I want you to imagine um, what's happening inside the pot. Because if I did this, you'd be like, Jet, I can't see. I'd be like, okay, I'm a bad counselor. What can I say? <laughs> all right. Um, so what we're going to do is you need to do three things. You must uh, wash rice, uh, you must rinse rice, and then you got to get your water correct. So all this means is, um, so when you, when you wash rice, you want to start with cold water, and you want to bring the water level uh, right up to the rice. And that, all washing means, friends, is you're going to take your fingers, um, run it through, rub the rice against itself. Not very hard. You don't have to get in there too too tough and too hard. Um, and then what you're going to see is this microfine water. I think we should do a close up. Uh, my best friend in the world, my wife, Ali Tila, is running camera. And uh, thanks, Ali. How about a big shout out, those of you on the Thanks, Ali. <laughs> thanks, Abby. <laughs> um, so you can see that this liquid here now has picked up all that starch. Um, and all that is, um, uh, friends, is this. Thanks, Allie. Um, I'm going to rinse while I talk. And all rinsing means is uh, water in and water out. So uh, when rice grows out of the ground, friends, uh, it doesn't look like this. It's not pearly and white and gorgeous. It actually has a husk on it. I want you to think about rice like an ear of corn, OK? Uh, when you pick an ear of corn uh, off the stalk, you've got the big covering. Uh, 
So the, the husk is that the big leaves that, that actually protect the corn. That's the first layer. The second layer, believe it or not, um, is actually the bran. And that's what makes rice brown. So after you, you bust off the, uh, the husk, you've got the bran. And then in order to get brown rice to be white, white rice, you have to polish every single grain. Not by hand, that was a big joke, <laughs> that, that wasn't funny. Um, you actually run it through a machine called a mill. Um, and the milling actually rubs off all that brown of the brand. So that's why we get a ton of uh, rice dust. So that's it. That's what we're trying to do here, all right? Now, the ultimate secret here is how much water to rice. And do I have any guesses out there? Um, I've heard one to one, one and a half to one, two to one, meaning two water, one rice. The magic does not need to be a measurement. It's in the finger. And this is what I'm saying. So when I insert my index finger, come on in, Allie. When I insert after washing, after rinsing, I insert my index finger into the rice. And when the tippy tip of my index finger touches the rice, the water line comes up to that crease, that first knuckle, what we call. And that's it. That's it right there. OK, cool. Thanks, Allie. Um, so. I've been using the bowl to demonstrate. I'm actually gonna transfer it all into a pot right now and make sure I get every grain of rice, not to waste any of it. Um, and then this will go over heat. Um, nice lid right there. I'm gonna put it on the stove. I'm gonna start that stove on high. That water starts at a boil. Once it boils, you reduce it to a simmer you keep it simmering for 18 to 20 minutes, no less, no more, all right? And uh, what you're gonna do is turn off the rice, and then I've actually done one ahead so you can see what that looks like. Uh, look what I've done. I've kept it lidded after the 18 to 20 minutes. I've not touched anything. Don't touch your rice. Let it rest because after it's done boiling, it's really delicate and it's really sensitive. We need to let it rest and hang out. And what, it, what happens is, uh, come on in, Allie. Let's, let me get you tight again. This has been cooked about 25 minutes ago. I lift off the lid. And then uh, using a spoon, look how firm that rice is. Now, the last step to prefer your rice is fluffing the rice. And all that means, friends, is using a, a, a spoon or um, you know a spatula to push that rice against each other. And that is perfect rice. I can identify every grain. It's chewy in texture. That is perfectly cooked rice. Um, that's it. And once I fluffed, I can hold this rice, serve it warm. I can put it in the fridge, make fried rice tomorrow. But there's your rice demo. It's that simple. If I know the questions you already have. Yo, Jet. I'm like, yes. If, you're at, <laughs> if I'm making brown rice, how do I do it? Well, if you're making brown rice, you can actually measure if you want and you can go one cup of brown rice to one and a half cups of water, or you could just do um, one and a half knuckles, since I've already taught you the knuckle trick. So, so there's how to make perfect rice. Cappy, take it away. That is like the, the demo of a lifetime, <laughs> to last a lifetime right there. Thousands of you cook it along, incredible. Um, everybody, we got a really special group of people cooking along with us today, the Boys and Girls Club of Collier County, Florida. Let's pop in to see how they're cooking down there in Florida. How's it going there, everybody? Hi. You all ready to cook? <laughs> Sounds like you're ready to cook. Anyone have a question for Chef before we uh, get going on the stir fry here? Hi, Chef. We love spice. If we want to make this dish spicy, what can we add? Oh, good question. She, no problem. I don't know if you heard that, Chef. He, um, she asked if they want to make the dish spicy, how would they do that? You bet. Hey, what's happening, guys? Um, yes. Uh, more and more younger kids love heat. And I'm so impressed by that. You have a lot of options here. So think of all the things that are spicy in your pantry. Straight chilies, and again, there's levels of heat you have from, from serranos all the way to habaneros. So that's just chilies just chopped up. You can do chili powders if you want, which lasts a very long time, have different flavors. And then finally, chili sauces. We all know sriracha. Uh, there's, but I want you to branch out and go out and find one more chili sauce. There's Tabasco, uh, there's gochujang, there's harissa. So those are all the ways you can add chili. The number one tip um, for, for you about chili is if 
you know what hot tastes like. But if some chili sauces also bring sour to the game with acid, some also bring salt to the game. So if you're, if you're adding sauces that have a lot of other flavors, balance those out. And I'll show you how to, uh, what I mean in a second when we get into the beef and broccoli sauce. Awesome. Good stuff. Thanks all boys and girls club of Collier County. We appreciate it. By the way, um, you know what, there's not always time where you can make rice from scratch. You don't have that 20 to cook and another 20 to rest. Um, it's okay. I do it myself with my kids. There is frozen rice. So make yes. sure um, to find uh, either frozen or packaged rice. I do like this bird's eye frozen rice because it steams in the bag and within a few minutes you're ready to go. And all you need to do is focus on what you're eating rice with. You could even actually steam it in the microwave and then uh, finish it and make fried rice. So it's okay. It's not a shortcut. It's just, it, it's, it's working smarter, not harder. Yes, it's chef, I'm guilty. I bought that same <laughs> rice this morning, as I mentioned, and I have uh, twin toddlers at home. So in a pinch, oh, man. you know, it's perfect. Wow. It's That's not amazing. like perfect, but you know what I mean. Perfect. It is pretty perfect, perfect yeah. by the way. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. And again, I've worked with chefs for 20, that, uh, 20 years that don't cook rice well. It's a, it's a true art. So sometimes if you're in a rush, let Bird's Eye do it for you. Yeah. Um, all right, so we move on to um, the next kind of two parts of, of the demo? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so beef and broccoli. Um, oh, it's kind of that savory gravy with beef uh, and, and, and broccoli. But I want you to start thinking about it in, 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 as, as, as techniques. So the first technique I'm going to teach you is what do we love about Asian um, stir fry meat dishes? They're usually very tender, where they're very silky. I call them slippery to eat. I'm going to teach you how the Chinese kitchens um, make a very tender meat. And the secret is marination, by the way. What is marination, kids? Put it in the Q&A below. In your, to you, what is marination? All right. Um, so to me, it's basically um, flavoring uh, something in a, in a liquid, right? A rub would be dry, a marinade would be wet. So let's start with a piece of meat. This is not, not a fancy piece of meat, right? Uh, with Asian food, you don't need to get the filet mignons of the world. You don't need to get the fancy steaks. Um, I think this is like a strip or New York strip. This could even be like a, a shoulder steak or, or, or even like chuck, right? But I'm gonna show you how to turn this into um, something really cool. Come on in, Allie. We're gonna, I'm gonna enlist Allie's help. The first and if, tip. And if someone, yeah, go ahead. Steak, if someone has flank steak, that works. If someone, there's not one. If you one, have flank steak, you're, you're in a great shape. You're in great right. shape. If you have any of the steaks that I mentioned, you're in even better shape. Um, I'm just gonna uh, t teach you with what I have here. I'm also not, yeah, sorry about that, Cappy. Good call on that. So right. if anything varies from the recipe, I will address that. Um, good catch, Cappy. So the number one uh, first tip about cutting your flank steak or your beef or anything at all is uh, cutting against the grain if you can. Um, and then the second one is cutting into thin slices. So I never cut chunks. So watch what I do. I'm going to take my knife. I'm going to find uh, where I can cut a tile. So I'm going to go there, that's my first piece. Your goal with cutting stir fry uh, campers is to make sure you cut meat in thin tiles. And it doesn't matter if it's chicken, pork, um, beef. If you cut it thin, firstly, it really it gives you a lot of surface area to capture that marinade, okay? If you have flank, um, if you have uh, cuts that are nice and tender, it takes less marination, but look at that. I always think about it as two fingers. So two fingers wide, right? And about two fingers long. So just remember uh, two fingers. So I'm gonna take this beef now, um, campers. I'm gonna put it inside a bowl and I'm gonna show you what uh, a Chinese marinade is, okay? Now, what is a marinade? It's a liquid, but now but the marinade usually provides flavor. Uh, Thanks, Ali. Man, such smooth camera work. It's She's like, great. it's amazing. She's great, isn't she? Ali, can we ship you around the country to do everyone's camera yeah. work? Is that all right? Yeah. Jada's tomorrow. So yeah, she's perfect. Close by, so yeah. that'll be easy. You know, no need to fly. Um, so, we're, so marination adds flavor. So let's talk about flavors, first of all. I'm going to do soy sauce, which you already have. Okay. And yes, if you're like, I don't, I want gluten-free soy sauce, then use tamari. No big deal. We know that this adds salt and savoriness. Sesame oil is um, an aromatic oil. In my opinion, uh, I use sesame oil for flavoring. So just a few drops over a stir fry oil. As a stir fry oil gets very, we need it to get very, very hot. Okay. Now that's flavor. How about uh, texture? In order to break this meat down, I'm using baking soda. 
Baking soda is highly acidic. So campers, what does acidic mean, right? What happens when acid uh, touches something, right? When you're, what does your stomach acids do? Uh, it basically breaks, breaks, breaks things down, okay? It, it tears down the fibers in a very controlled way here. So it makes that tough meat tender. Uh, lastly, on the, on the uh, ingredients, a cornstarch, okay? So cornstarch, uh, does what? It actually is a, a gelatinizer. So uh, all the ingredients that I put in here, I'm adding oil to this now, that's going to pull the soy sauce in, the sesame oil in, um, and, and that's going to, that's gonna basically going to do a lot of things. So just to recap, um, I'm using any cut of meat I want. And if you're doing tofu, friends, you don't need to do any of this. You can do the flavorings, you don't need to do the tenderizing, okay? And the more tender the meat you're starting out with is, do you think you need more or less tenderizer? Yeah, you guys know what's up. I mean, I don't know. I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are, you guys are super smart. So that's it. That can sit in a uh, fridge-proof bowl, and that can be put in from one hour to four hours to overnight. Remember, the tougher the meat, the longer the the tenderizing um and there's a very fancy chefs don't use the word tenderizing we usually use the word denature it'll denature you can just sound like a chef in the, in, in 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 your house <laughs> and be like mom don't call mom or dad say sous chefs <laughs> tenderize and denature that protein um so this has been in the fridge now uh for about three to four hours i did it this morning but when i ran um big asian restaurants I would do about 100 pounds at a time, and then I would pack them in 10 to 20 pound flats and vacuum pack them and just stick them in the freezer and then let them kind of like slack out, it's, which is another word for basically going from frozen to uh, cold, all right? So any questions on uh, denaturing or tenderizing and marinating beef? Any question? Mm. Okay. And what you realize is the cornstarch has sucked in all of that deliciousness and it becomes a dry product. So, so that's what I'm looking for. Uh, how are you doing out there? We, we, we good on that denaturing and tenderizing stuff? I think everyone's doing good. Obviously, everybody, if you're doing this in real time, you won't be letting this sit right. for an hour, unless you just want to watch and wait and cook it later. <laughs> but you know, I know you all are going to be making this for a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth time. So Big you, know, time. You, know, you could see from there on out how long you want to let it sit for and marinate. Cool. Another tip now is uh, I'm cooking meat and I'm cooking vegetables in the pan. They have different cook times, right? So because I've cut my meat thinner, it's probably going to cook quicker. So this broccoli is going to take me a lot longer. We are going to level that playing field by what we call blanching, okay? And uh, in the traditional kitchen, anyone have a guess as to what blanching is? Mm -hmm. Um, so another, another uh, uh, tangent, again, um, in the world of cooking, there's only really two types of heat, okay? There's either moist heat or there's dry heat. And the traditional ways of cooking you do, sauteing is dry, grilling is dry, roasting is dry. The moist side is boiling, steaming, uh, et cetera. So, um, so there it is. So what, what I usually do in a restaurant, when I, I have a big old wok, and then I've got a big old pot of water always rolling. Um, and I'll have to submerge these broccoli in that boiling water while I'm starting my stir fry. But in the home, it's, it's a big old pain to uh, actually set up an entire blanching station, meaning you gotta set up an entire boiling water setup and then an ice bath. So I've taken some broccoli crowns, okay, florets. I put a little water in there and I'm gonna use technology to help me. So I'm taking a little bit of a, a plastic wrap and I'm gonna use the microwave now to help me blanch. Does that make sense? Although technically it's not blanching, it still falls into the moist heat. This is gonna go into the microwave for one and a half minutes. All right. And the steam that's created uh, with the water and the uh, plastic wrap covering is basically giving me a blanch, all right? So uh, last step of mise en place, which is a fancy word for getting all my prep done, is making the stir fry sauce. Now, most people have told you that soy sauce is the key to Chinese cooking. It is not. The <laughs> key to Chinese cooking is oyster sauce. And I know it sounds like, oh, I don't like oysters, Jet. But if you've eaten Chinese food, you've eaten oysters, 
in sauce. Um, and again, if you're allergic to oysters, you can get vegetarian oyster sauce, which is made from mushrooms. So we're gonna start by making our stir fry sauce um, uh, with oyster sauce. So this is a pretty potent sauce and I need a lot of sauce. So if I use all oyster sauce, it'd be pretty darn salty. So I'm gonna back that up with a little bit of chicken stock. And this is a chicken stock that I've made ahead of time. This basically extends the sauce, but also creates more flavor because it's, it's chicken stock. And I could pretty much stop here, friends, but if you want to get fancy, you could add rice wine to this. You could add a drop or two of sesame oil to this, but this is your basic brown sauce. The only thing I'm missing here is a, a thickener because I like a saucy um, uh, uh, stir fry. So this is cornstarch again. I'm going to add equal parts of cold water to cornstarch. And there's a fancy word for this. This is called a slurry. That's all that is. But I needed the water to break down the cornstarch so it wouldn't clump. And then I'm going to add the cornstarch to my sauce. Hey, Chef, and, question. Uh, yeah, of course. For those yes. who may be using the rice wine, um, some people yeah. asking difference between rice wine and rice wine vinegar. Oh, you bet. You know what? I've got a little rice wine here. So let me, let me pull it really quick. So um, good call, guys. Rice wine is a, um, is a wine that's brewed from rice. So there's no acid in it. Rice wine vinegar, friends, is actually uh, vinegar. Uh, so uh, a fermented vinegar, so it's very sour. So rice wine has the taste of wine. Uh, and I have it here, but again, friends, if I'm gonna put it in the sauce uh, right there. But if you're staying away from alcohol, or you don't do any of that stuff, it does burn off. But that's the difference. Rice wine vinegar is a vinegar. Rice wine is a cooking uh, wine. So just so you know, and they taste totally different. Um, and if, if those of you that are older campers that are over 21, you can also use sherry. You could also use, you could use sherry as well. Hope awesome. that answers the question, Cap. It, Cap it, it yeah. does. That's great. It, do you mind if I add, add, We have another great no, question. No, no, I know. Let's um, do a you're bunch of about... Q&A because, you know, I'm really all that's left is just the stir fry and putting it all together. So. Awesome. So everybody, we'll give you time to catch up if you're slicing meat, mixing your marinade, mixing your sauce, and, and we'll do a couple of questions because we have some incredible ones coming in. We have one from Benjamin. Um, he says, while not typically Asian, do you ever season your water when making rice to give it a different flavor with chicken stock or something? Oh, Benjamin, or that's, do you a, only flavor that's a apple? brilliant question. So yeah. uh, let's break down rice a little bit. Most of the Asian countries like Japan, Korea, Thailand, uh, when we make rice, um, we don't season our rice because the thought is the food that you're eating is, is going, it, you don't want to mess with those flavors. So the stir fry is going to carry all the flavor. The rice is the starch uh, to eat with it. Once you add a liquid that's flavored, like chicken stock or a meat stock, um, or even a water that's flavored or salted, and you, and you toast your rice with oil, that's called a pilaf. So um, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with pilaf. So culturally, Many Asian cultures that eat stir fry don't season their rice, uh, but then you have like Indian biryanis and different types of rice that are more pilaf. So again, we're learning together here. So a plain rice is one thing, a pilaf is another thing. So that's a great question, by the way. So if you wanted to start with a little onion and garlic and a little oil and then do a flavored rice, nothing wrong with that at all. That's amazing. Good yeah, question. Great question. In. I believe it's from Gaff, who's eight years old, cooking in South Point, Ohio. What's up, buddy? What's up? He wants to know. He wants to know what's the coolest gadget in your kitchen. Oh wow! Uh, I have. I'm a gadget head. Uh, so you? I've got a vacuum packer. It's a huge chamber vacuum packer in here. I've got an oven that uh, microwave and a roasting oven and a steamer that does it all. So, um, but I, so those are all my favorite gadgets. I got to tell you. Um, that's a good question. What is your favorite kitchen gadget, friends? Uh, when it, if it comes to my favorite, it's got to be my knives. I've got an entire drawer full of like 100 knives in there. So, um, so those are all important to me. I, I dig them. Awesome. That's a good we'll question. Take, we'll take one more good question coming in, and then we'll uh, get going. Hopefully, everyone's in a good spot. This question's from Sam. He wants to know how he or she, apologies, want to know uh, how old were you when you first started cooking? Sam, uh, the, 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 the answer to that question is uh, probably about three and a half years old. Mm -hmm. My grandparents had restaurants in China. Uh, they immigrated to Thailand, so they had restaurants in Thailand. 
And then when they came, my parents moved to America in 1966. They opened their first restaurant in 78. So um, I basically grew up cooking. And um, of all the little kids in my generation, and there are a lot of them because my dad had six brothers, um, I wasn't, shall we say, the best at schoolwork. All right. <laughs> so um, my grandmother took me under her wing at a very early age. So as soon as I could stand, uh, she put me on a stool and I would start by uh, mixing sauces, cleaning rice, picking vegetables. And as I got older and, and more responsible, she, I graduated onto cutting things and then cooking things. So, so um, you know, she really kind of saved my life that way because, you know, she focused. I was a kid who, who had some focus issues and she helped and she really shaped me by focusing. So I've been cooking since I was about three and a half years old, professionally cooking uh, probably over 25 years now. So uh, this is what I've been doing my entire life. Amazing. Good question. Yeah, I'm going to grab right. the broccoli. I'm going to grab yeah. the broccoli really grab quick. Grab the yeah. broccoli. Good question. We'll give a little shout out here. Shout out to uh, Reese Brooklyn cooking in Chicago with her mom, Nikki. Looks like her brother, Charlie, may have a good lunch or dinner coming up soon. Ooh, that's shout awesome. Out you all. <laughs> shout out, y'all. Perfect. Um, another thing, too, guys. Uh, I, I keep hitting this hard, but uh, uh, I'm okay with, the, with uh, the, 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 the smart shortcut. So, again, bird's eye, I had them send me some uh, steamed broccoli again it steams right in the bag it's frozen yeah so again all these things can be can be done really quick. hey um cappy I, yeah. I had a box of cooking equipment show up at my door yes um, sir a few days ago and this phenomenal walk showed up who do i thank for this by you the way? are this is awesome you are too kind that is thank you to our good friends at potsandpans.com which will share info for them and you'll get it in your thank you email you could find tons of hey Pots and pans. <laughs> Pots and pans. Um, but check them out. They have some great, great, great product. And also, by the way, step back on that bird's eye stuff. Incredible because um, I also love it. And here's why. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes for some people, something isn't always in season or not fresh right. or they don't have access to it. So what people, I think it's um, some, like, some people's point of view on frozen may be a little different when in reality, these ingredients are picked at their peak of freshness. They're flash frozen, so it locks in all the nutrients, and they're just delicious, quite frankly. The truth, brother. You speak the truth. Um, again, I've cooked all over the country. I've cooked all over the world. And when I'm in a place that I can't, where I can't get um, fresh, uh, frozen is really truly picked at the peak of freshness. Um, so, so there you go. This is what the broccoli looks like. It looks like a little balloon. It's steamed up. It's come down, and these broccoli are perfect ready to go. You do want to blanch because again, even at that cook time, and also you guys know what raw broccoli tastes like. There's this kind of woody uh, flavor there that, that you know, you, you don't want the raw taste. You want the sweetness of the vegetable. Also, since we're here, guess what? Our rice is done. And this is what it looks like. Come on, Natalie. Let's show, let's show people what um, fresh cooked rice is. I'm not going to get in there and mess with it because um, <clears throat> you learned the jet peeler rules. All right. So look at that. All that steam escaping. That's fresh cooked rice. And then that needs to rest now. The, all the water is absorbed. And the way I tell that is just by tipping the pan. And uh, that's it. So that's going to rest for 20 minutes. Um, and then I'll be ready to go. But I did do that one ahead. But that's how simple rice is. And I'm looking for a rice that is chewy to the touch, where uh, the grains are not broken up in any way. Um, so there it is. Perfect. Thank you very much. Incredible. And so right. right before we get going here on the certified jet, can I ask you to expand upon um, cutting meat against the grain and why cut it against the grain? hundred percent. So kids, you guys will hear the term cut against the grain very, very often. Um, meat is basically uh, muscle tissue, okay, in the animal. And uh, muscle tissue is made up of fibers. And think about your fingers, just like that. These are, imagine these being fibers banded together. This is a piece of muscle. Let's say this is a flank steak. This because it's shaped like one. My hands are big old flappy flank steaks, okay? Now, um, the muscles are very uh, strong fibers, okay? And if you keep them banded together, uh, they're, they're very inflexible, okay? And they're very tough, which what that means is when I cook this, um, they're gonna contract and get even tougher. So imagine, if you will, uh, a strand of rubber bands all together. Those are the grains. If I take a knife and I cut with the grain, I'm keeping the muscle fibers intact and together cooked. They'll get very tough in the mouth. 
if I take a knife and cut them perpendicularly and split that band of rubber bands into a flat piece, those, those fibers have nothing to hold on to and hence uh, tender meat. So that's why chefs are always saying cut against the grain because you want the tenderest piece possible. Now, certain muscles will be tough no matter what. Um, imagine, if you will, I am a cow, all right? I walk on these legs. I'm usually sitting this way. So what's the tough part? Things that move a lot, right? So there's my, my, my legs and my shoulders are doing most of the work because I'm walking all day long. The pieces that are, don't do a lot of work are in my back. The, the filet mignon, the strip steak, the rib eyes. So that's why these pieces of meat are going to be less tough. These are going to be more tough simply because they do more work. So, so, so that's why we do this marination situation. We take tougher pieces of meat, right? Uh, and then we can tenderize them where you don't have to do that here with these pieces of meat. I hope that makes sense. I hope that I, hope that I explained it makes, that well. It makes complete sense. And campers, I will tell you from experience, because I spent a lot of money on culinary school, which I do highly recommend, but you all just <laughs> yeah. got a whole lesson, a whole class in, in meat right. fabrication. That's exactly right. <laughs> we just did butchery 101 right there. There you go. Uh, awesome. All right, campers, shall we fire stir fry? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. All right, so do you need a walk? Um, it's awesome to have one, but you don't need one. If you're at home, just a skillet, anything with semi to very high sides. Uh, it could be a frying pan, or it could be a Dutch oven, any of that stuff. Uh, critical steps. Number one, preheat. And you see, you saw that I've done that ahead of time. Number two, use the right oil. And uh, oh, I forgot my aromatics. Wait a minute, I gotta move my aromatics. I've got garlic I need to cut here. Uh, all right, I was like, hey, I was gonna tell you step three was aromatics. And I'm like, I don't have no aromatics. <laughs> So, all right, so check it out. I'm gonna take my pieces of garlic, take a, a cleaver and just do this. I'm just smashing it into little pieces. Watch this, smash into little pieces. And this is, uh, when I was a kid and when I was in culinary school, uh, this is the food processor right here, okay? We ain't got no food processors and garlic presses. <laughs> this is it. We learned how to use these when I, in my generation. Okay, so that was fast. Oil. Uh, high temperature, low flavor, peanut, canola, grapeseed, any of that stuff. The next thing I'm looking for is um, the oil to be smoking a little bit. I think Allie's gonna come in a little here uh, and show what's happening so we can catch that stir fry. Chef, if you wouldn't mind, you might um, just tip in the, the rice pot handle um, out a little bit. Oh just... yeah, of course, yeah. let's do that. Thank you. All right, and Allie's coming in right now. So um, that oil is smoking slightly, okay? Now I'm gonna grab I'm gonna grab the garlic. That's gonna go in. Perfect. I'm here. Uh, yep. Perfect. Yep. And then, uh, and then I'm gonna go with my meat. And this is the marinated meat. Now I was moving fast because the pan was hot, but now I can slow down a little bit uh, because I need to brown that meat. Every time you throw something into the pan, friends, you lose some temperature. So, uh, and meat usually comes from the refrigerator at about 40 degrees. So I'm gonna take my time, use the entire surface area here. And then you can do the fancy flip if you want, but you don't have to do that, all right? But I do wanna take some, a minute to brown that meat. Because I've marinated, I don't have all this moisture leaching out of the meat. I'm getting a great brown and a great sear ready. And uh, here we go. So now I'm thinking ahead. What do I need? What am I missing here, campers? What did I put in the microwave? Oh, uh, broccoli. That's correct. We're all screaming so, vegetables, more vegetables. <laughs> exactly. And what? If, and remember, this is beef and broccoli. But as a technique, you could make pork and vegetables, chicken and vegetables, tofu and vegetables. Same exact um, technique. All right. Look, I've got a beautiful sear. Now I'm going to add my blanched broccoli. Oh, that's starting to look good. All right. I'm going to get that a toss. And I want, the, I want the broccoli to get a little bit of love and get a little steering happening there. So every few seconds, I'm gonna turn it over on itself. And you can use tongs here, you could use a spoon. It does not have to be fancy flips. Uh, again, I've been doing this for a very long time. So I'm, I'm listening. The pan is telling me, Jed, I'm still hot. I still hear a sear. All right, one more toss so that some of the broccoli is, is getting nice and brown. The beef is already brown. Now that cornstarch in the sauce needs to be uh, reincorporated. And what should I do? I'm going right in. 
and cornstarch needs to come to temperature. So that means it needs to get to 180 degrees. It needs to get to the boil, which is 212. So if I know if I'm close, I'm good to go. Now it's gonna happen fast because this pan is super hot. Now check that out. I pretty much have a stir fry. But if you're like, Jet, I want more sauce, bro. I need <laughs> more stuff to coat my rice. Ali's going to pan out. I'm going to show you how, like, oh, no, I'm in the restaurant, and I can make a little quick sauce. Watch this. My bowl's in there. Little Again, I get a little bit of that, which is the chicken stock. I can add my sauces, soy, oyster, sesame, any of that good stuff. And I could do a quick sauce. So in the Chinese restaurant, we always, always, always have all these ingredients with us. We can get them in and then bring that back to a boil. Yo, we've just made beef and broccoli. I'm going to show you how to put it all together. So I, because I've got more of the liquid in there, I needed to reduce a little bit. So that's it. I'm going to pull a plate out. We're going to plate this up with our fresh rice. And we are in business, friends. We are in business. Yes. It's so fast. Asian cooking, once you kind of have all the ingredients and all your mise en place ready to go, it's a very simple thing to do. All right. Rice. Let's put a little rice in the, in the you guys went on the side. I'm going to do the smother. Are you guys good if I do the smother? I'm going to do rice on the bottom. When I make and the side, I'm going to do whatever you do. How's that? <laughs> I'll take that, brother. <laughs> and uh, Allie, come on in. Let's do this final uh, little plate up. And then we can uh, taste, uh, take some questions if we want. Yeah. But check it out. So I've got my rice in. And I'm just going to add Gosh, some beef and broccoli. My mouth is watering. Oh, man. I wish you guys could smell the deliciousness that's happening in here. Look at that. The gravy. Yeah. Man, that's what I'm talking about right there. Yes, get in there, Allie. There you go, campers. Beef and broccoli, perfect rice. Gosh. Pretty balanced meal. You got your starches, you got your protein, you got your vegetables. Um, there it is. Absolutely, incredible it's stuff. that simple. It everybody, really is. yes, post your dishes on Instagram, everybody, and tag our, our cooking, hashtag our cooking camp. We want to see uh, what they all look like. We know you guys have been posting along and, and yeah. uh, cooking along and posting, and all your dishes look so good. I had a great question oh, from yeah. Whitney here. Whitney Go wanted for to Whitney. know if we wanted to add more veggies or replace the broccoli, what veggies would you recommend? Whitney, it's a great question. Think textural, okay? Um, what is crispy like broccoli? I would think um, I would go carrots, slice really thin. I would go asparagus, kind of cut up in a one or two inch pieces. Um, I would even use frozen, more frozen vegetables. Cauliflower would be delicious corn peas this is a technique for you to get into your fridge burn out all those vegetables that chicken breasts if you make this do tag me as well if you please tag at jet tila because i want to see your dishes and uh the rr camp so that's a good question i'm happy to take more guys if you've had any more questions but that, yeah, yeah that's that was awesome that's delicious yeah so let's give a quick shout out uh, again to our partners at boys and girls club of america i want to uh point out someone big high five to toby perkins toby's a club member at the naval air station in tennessee uh toby is going to pursue a career in culinary arts so go toby go toby go navy that's right yes good stuff here all right everybody campers campers keep cooking if you're if you're if your uh, stove's on high <laughs> uh but a big thank you to today's guest cam counselor jet tila if you have a few minutes, as he said, he's going to stick around and answer some more questions. Um, this is an incredible teacher, everybody. Um, take advantage of it. Um, let's kick it off here. Yeah, I've also got the, I've, I brought in my, uh, my, my little device here and I can read if I want to. I could also oh, read yeah. questions with you um, and pick and choose. So uh, we've already camped, uh, Ashley's already answered about uh, subs. But yeah, uh, Cappy, have you got some uh, that's popping at you? Let me know, For man. For sure, we could, yeah, whatever you see also. We have a, a few people asking, favorite thing to cook in quarantine? Oh, you know what? Um, if you go to our social media, I've cooked so much stuff. So uh, Ali has made every pastry known to man. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and deliciously. Uh, she made cloud food tea, which is a fancy kind of pastry. That's one of my favorite things. Um, for me, you know what? I've been cooking just about everything. Uh, you know, I've made, it, I've made the obligatory quarantine banana bread. 
Um, I have made, um, a, a, I've done a bunch of stuff. Uh, I've done actually another friend of mine, Artie Sequeres. I've done her curries. Uh, I've made meat dishes. I've made, I have cooked so much as, as, as a form of therapy, as a form of community for my family. Uh, I have cooked a lot of stuff. So, um, Good um Joss. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You know, go for it. Go for it, brother. I'm reading <laughs> as, you're, as I'm listening. We'll, we'll go question for question. Jocelyn is asking, who's your, who, do you have a cooking role model? Uh, you know, my cooking role model, you know, was definitely the grandma that I spoke about, you know, mm. she definitely took me under her wing. Um, but I also do like, uh, I would say, uh, the three gentlemen on food network that have really taken me under their wing, uh, would be Alton Brown, uh, Bobby Flay and Guy Fieri. And those three, uh, chefs and entrepreneurs have been role models for me in my, my, my kind of 10 years, um, on food network. So for, for sure. Um, what's the second oil he used? Yes, uh, well, our, our team, Kristen, good for you. Our team is on these questions. I don't even need to really, can we use hoisin sauce instead of oyster sauce? That's a good one. Um, hoisin sauce is on the sweet side. So Asian flavors are hot, sour, salty, sweet, and savory. Hot, sour, salty, sweet, and savory. Um, my, in my opinion, your job, my job as an Asian cook is to balance those five flavors. So if I bring those flavors in balance, I create a dish like this. Hoisin is on the sweet side of that five flavor scale. So if you're gonna use hoisin, which is sweet and sticky, you gotta bring in a little more soy, which is salt and savory to balance it out together. Um, the, the very, very good question. So uh, minced garlic. So I did use the minced garlic and the minced garlic was in the wok right after the oil. Remember I pounded it with my knife and got it in there. I almost, I almost forgot to cut it. So. Let's see. How old are you? Oh, I got that question. Um, all right. Hey, what do you see out there, Cappy? I see Beth asking the most difficult thing you've ever cooked. Ooh. Um, so I have, I have six world records and um, what I've done, gosh, let's go through them. I have a 440 foot California roll and that was really, really difficult. Um, I have a, a six, 14,000 or 16,000 pound fruit salad. Um, I've got a 420 foot granola bar. And those were all really, really difficult because it takes a lot of coordination uh, to, to get that much food and, and an, an entire mini army to coordinate and, and do it. So um, can I blanch without the microwave? Erica wants to know. Erica, absolutely. So again, Ashley's on it, man. Like our camp staff is the best. Uh, I almost can't find a question that hasn't been answered. That is, that is super cool. <laughs> I got Man. a good one we could wrap. I mean, I could sit here all day, to be honest, but I got yeah. a good one we could end on it um, if we want. We say, we had someone ask, um, what is this question here? I'm a culinary student and feel that there's so much to learn. Are you still mm. learning things in the kitchen at this point in your career? That's a good one to wrap on. Um, I and Cappy would tell you to any of us culinarians, if you turn your mind off to learning, then you're never gonna, you're, stop, you're also stopping yourself from growing. So I learn every single day. Uh, and I, I learn from peers, I learn from my wife, I learn from reading. So you have to feed your brain uh, every single day as a culinarian. And like no other time in the world, friends, there's so much great and free information out there via books, via magazines, via digital. Um, you can, you can reach out directly to your chefs, uh, favorite chefs via like, you know, social media. It is a, such a cool time in the world. And your job as a culinarian is to continue to learn, uh, and, and not just learn, but you need to apply because one layer of learning is, is absorbing. The second layer is doing, because when that translates into what things feel like and what they taste like and what they, you know, uh, how they work together and all your senses, that, that puts that information even deeper into your brain. And the ultimate test of, of learning is teaching. Once you can actually learn it and then you can apply it and then you can kind of articulate it to someone else, that's that full chain, in my opinion, of knowing something. So, so always learn, always keep hanging, you know, hang in there and, and keep working. And it was really fun to hang out with you guys today. I really appreciate it. I'd like yes. to thank Ali Pila for always thank having my back. And uh, Cappy, like, thank you, thank Rachel, thank Ship, thank uh, Pots and Pans, thanks Bird's Eye. It was so fun to be here. And again, I, even after this class, if you guys hang out on our social media, uh, you can learn more stuff, we can correspond more, but thanks so much from the Tila House, guys.
Thank you. I, I, I have to end with one more. Uh, I got a little buddy here on Q&A, Lucas, and he's asking, when's the first time you made this recipe? There you go, Lucas. Oh, Lucas, a uh, good one. Hey, Lucas, shout out to you. First time I made this recipe, this is definitely one of those recipes that I made with my grandmother way back in the day. Um, you know, uh, I would sit there back in the day before you could buy really convenient broccoli, you had to get the whole stalk and I would peel broccoli and cut crowns. So, so all these little, the little touch points are, are little sense memories that remind me of, of my childhood and cooking with my family. So a good question, Lucas. Thank you so much. I do have the day off of camp tomorrow, so my canteen co-captain Randy will be back. Someone please tell him you left his water bottle in the mess hall yesterday. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you back in the kitchen for another day of camp. Stay safe and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you again.